and helping turn it into a reality. Uh, the Zoom uh, platform is an exciting idea that we've already realized has potential implications well beyond what we're going to do this morning. So please keep that in mind as you watch this morning and when we ask for feedback, uh, feel free to share any thoughts you have on how we might better use this to improve communications within our community. That, of course, is why we're together this morning. Uh, Dallas called me and, and said, you know, some of our members are already starting to climb the walls and we need to do something. And that's where he started this idea, and that is our intent this morning, is just to take your mind and my mind and everybody's mind off of what's going on outside uh, for an hour at least and uh, focus us all on woodworking and give us the opportunity to get back in touch with one another, at least uh, through video, uh, obviously not personally, but at least we'll get a chance to see everybody. And I've already enjoyed the morning watching all of the pictures of all of you coming on. It's good to see you again, even though it's not in person. I was at the shop on Monday. I drove out there. It is still there. Uh, it's very empty and very lonely. And obviously uh, all of us regret that, uh, that we're not there, but hopefully this will uh, do at least a little bit to fill the gap. The plan this morning is for me to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking to you about how to build a wood putter. And uh, uh, what I'm gonna do is spend the first half or 15 minutes of the time talking about the actual design and construction of the putter, and then spend the last 15 minutes talking about how to apply a full gloss uh, polyurethane finish to it. Um, I certainly recognize that uh, probably not all of you are gonna run right out and wanna build a golf putter. And so I'm going to try to tailor my remarks to uh, sharing with you. I've, I've made, by the way, I've made over a thousand of these things, if you can imagine. I got started uh, 12 or 15 years ago. I, would, I was a golfer and needed a new putter, and I couldn't find what I liked. So like any good woodworker, I said, I ought to be able to build a putter. So I gave it a shot, and after two or three tries, uh, uh, put one together that seemed to work pretty well. Uh, it took me a while longer to figure out how to finish it, and we'll talk some more about that in a few moments. But anyway, over the course of building as many as I have, I've learned a few things, uh, and I've made a lot of, most importantly, made a lot of mistakes. And uh, nothing else, I think I can perhaps save you from saving, uh, making the same mistakes, but also give you some tricks and techniques that I've picked up that I think you can apply to a variety of projects, not just to uh, making the golf butter. So. Hopefully that's the case. I'll try to keep it moving along. Uh, I'm gonna go through the entire presentation first. If you have questions, please jot them down and we'll give you time at the end to, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do a Q&A session, but let's go straight through and, and give everybody the information first and then we can open it up for discussion. All right, uh, Mike, if you wanna turn us over to the other uh, screen. Uh, first step. First step in uh, building a golf cart. Can everybody hear me? You're a little, uh, you're a little muffled, Gary. Okay. Um, let me see if that's better. Can that help? A little bit. It's still kind of weird sounding. Really? Okay. All right. Let me and let me take the time to. How do you guys? Can, he's kind of garbled to me. Can you hear him any better? Yeah, he's too far away from whatever microphone is the default when he moves over to the other computer. Yeah. Uh, by the way, as he's figuring that out, I wrote a note in the chat area about how. With 40 people coming, we should probably send a note out in advance to make sure that as many as people as possible install in advance, and those who have problems have somebody they can ask for help because it could kill the first half hour. Oh, easy. I'll uh, when you get done here, I'll I'll send that email out to everybody in the class. Great. Wonderful, thank you. Hey there, girl. Hi. Hi there. There we go. Okay, how's that? That's great. That's better, much better. All right, All right. we'll have to work on how we're gonna do that tomorrow. Um, yes. All right, <laughs> so let's talk about uh, the actual construction. Uh, 
want to make it out of. And that's strictly a matter of personal taste. Uh, the one thing I will tell you that um, over the years I've learned is that the uh, more dramatic a piece of wood in terms of character, be it burl or uh, distinguishing characteristics of the wood or just pretty wood, uh, the more the putter is going to pop, the more conversation you're going to get from it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the use of a, a template to help you with that. Uh, this is a piece of olive, and as you can see, it's a pretty attractive piece of wood. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, that would probably make a good looking putter, and I agree with you, I think it will. However, it's not quite as simple as that, is one of the things I've learned over the years. And the way I've learned to cope with that or get the most out of a piece of wood is to develop a template or a, what I call a negative template. I used to use a, a template that was actually in the shape of the putter. But by creating a negative template that has the hole in the middle that's the, the shape of the putter you're going to make, it allows you to uh, take a look at that piece of wood and figure out what the best layout of that putter would be. Now, for example, you might want both of those knot holes in your putter. Or you might decide, no, maybe just one and maybe right in the middle. Or you might decide, see, if you just took this piece and cut it up into four pieces and tried to get four putters out of it, one of the putters is going to look like that, which is pretty blasé. Uh, so again, if you take the time to create yourself a, a template like this, you can test a variety of, of different looks and decide which one you like the best, and then go ahead and draw that in and, and cut it out and you'll wind up with a putter that's going to look a lot more like you thought it would when you first started looking at the piece of wood. Uh, if you'd like one of these negative templates, I ran a bunch when I was at the shop on Monday. And if you just want to send me an email with your mailing address, I'll be happy to stick one envelope to you and send it out to you. All right, so now you've got your piece of wood selected that you decided you want to use to make the putter. Um, this is a piece of vaulted tamarind that uh, is a very popular look on putter. They seem to sell very well. Uh, so you want to cut yourself out a piece that's about two and a half inches wide and about four and a half inches long. And then I recommend putting a center stripe in it because golfers like a center stripe down the middle of the putter. So simply cut it in half and then you can decide what kind of look uh, in the center. I recommend a, a sharp contrast with the wood around it. So if you're going to go with a light wood like this, use something dark. Uh, you can use just a piece of ebony like that. Uh, I made up some laminate one day and cut it into slices. So if you're looking for something fancy, you can do something like that. The other thing is to work pretty well, and I recommend, is uh, it just adds a little pop to it is highlighting your center strip with just a piece of veneer on either side of it. And uh, it just makes that, that center stripe stand out a little bit more. So that's another technique you can use. You can even use two or three pieces of veneer and get an even more uh, exaggerated look or put an emphasis on that center stripe. At this point, it's time to glue up this particular portion of the putter block. And I recommend using epoxy. Um, and the reason I do that is because I used to use yellow glue when I first started. And I found when I went to put polyurethane on the putter head, occasionally I would get a mark right along the joint lines where the, the finish wouldn't cover. And you'd see a, a demarcation along that line. Come to find out polyurethane does not stick to yellow glue. So even if you have a perfect joint, the, uh, the yellow glue seeping into the sides of that wood when you clamp it together will be enough to thwart the uh, polyurethane's ability to cling to that, that wood. So way to get around all of that is strictly simply go to epoxy, which is a stronger joint anyway, and it, uh, it will not interfere with your ability to put a nice polyurethane uh, finish on the putter. So go ahead and uh, put some epoxy on there, glue it up, and let it set overnight. Um, <clears throat> next morning you come in, you should have a, a, a putter block that looks something like this. And the next step, and I'm obviously switching to different types of wood here, but the next step is to put the sole plate on. So you want to put a, a sole plate on the bottom of the putter for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, the finished putter to be at least an inch 
and an eighth or an inch and a quarter thick, and you'll probably need some additional thickness. The other thing a sole plate does in addition to dressing it up is it adds strength to uh, the joints of the, uh, the putter surface or the putter block itself. So the next step then is to epoxy that sole plate to the bottom of the block that you created yesterday. So go ahead and put epoxy on there, clamp it up again, and wait another year. Um, next morning you're gonna come in and you're gonna wind up with that nice glued up block, take the time to square it up. By the way, always check this angle for square. It's very easy for that to get just slightly off. And one of the things I've learned that again, I will share with you that I think might be of use to you is that I've learned is the smaller the item that you're making, the more a simple error like being just slightly out of the square will show. And I can show you a piece that I've done that where I wasn't careful about that. Just being a degree or two off stands out very markedly. You'd be surprised at how easy that is. To so always check it for square. So now you've got your block. Now the putter or the putter head pretty well assembled. The problem you got is you've got to make it heavier. Uh, most putter heads are heavier than a simple block of wood will create, and you, you'll find that you'll need to add six to eight ounces of weight uh, to the putter head itself. What we're going to do that is I'm going to go to the mortiser and I'm going to channel out a rectangular groove in the face where the face of the putter is going to be. That's going to be two inches wide. I'm going to use a half inch wide mortising bit, so it's going to be a half inch tall, and it's going to go an inch and a half into the um, uh, putter block itself. That's the right size cavity to add about seven or eight ounces uh, of weight to the putter block and the way we do that is we fill it with lead. So here's one that I've already got mortised out in the dimensions that I talked about and the challenge is to add some lead to it. So Michael I'm going to ask you to go ahead and switch me back to the other camera if you would and I'll show you how I do that. Very high tech method for melting and pouring the lead. And if you can see that, and I'm gonna speak sideways so that, I can, that you can hear me into the microphone, but uh, what you wanna do is just put lead in an old ladle, put something around the handle so you don't burn yourself. And you literally just by holding that ladle a couple of inches above the flame on a uh, propane torch like this, uh, within 30 to 60 seconds, you'll be able to melt that lead down. And then you just take and pour it into the cavity on that putter head. And that's how you add the weight uh, to the putter head. Okay, let's go back to the block, Michael, if we can. So what you'll now wind up with is something that looks like this, and you've got the lead securely in there. Uh, the other way to do this is to form a mold, if you wish, and uh, uh, prepare the, uh, the lead piece that will slip in there, and then epoxy it in it. will add a little bit of strength to the putter head, but it's uh, much simpler, believe me, to just pour it right into the cavity itself. So now that you've got that done, it's time to add a uh, faceplate uh, to the putter blank to cover over uh, the lead insert and also this is going to be the surface that's going to strike the the, uh, the golf ball itself. I use epoxy for uh, the face plates on almost every putter that I do. Uh, excuse me, ebony, not epoxy. Ebony, that blackwood, you know. Uh, I use it because it's hard, it's dark, it's a nice contrast, it, it kind of dresses up, but above all, it is it is hard and it's, it will uh, stand up very well against an infinite number of, of strikes of the golf ball. So one more gluing step is you cut that uh, face plate and glue it on. You can use other woods. I used to use coca bola, which is obviously a very attractive and, and dressy wood. Uh, I've got to the point where I'm allergic to coca bola, so I can't do that anymore. The epoxy or ebony is, is my choice for it. Um, the faceplate of the block. So that's what a finished block is going to end up looking like. And now you're ready to go ahead and cut it out and to begin to shape it. Uh, all you have to do to cut it out is just simply draw the shape using again your template and then just using the bandsaw or scroll saw to cut it out and you wind up with uh, the putter, the 
basic shape of the putter head that looks like this. And now you've got to round the edges. Uh, and the way I do that is simply by uh, holding it against a, a belt sander. I've got a stationary uh, flatbed six inch belt sander and I literally just hold this against the surface of the sandpaper that's going along underneath here. And I just shape it by going back and forth like that. And then I'll just flip it over and shape it going back and forth like that. Uh, that will get you to a rough shape that looks pretty much like this. Okay. The next step is it will be rough. So the next step is to take a rasp and literally rasp and smooth out the, uh, the rough spots from the uh, belt sanding until you get a nice smooth shape. This takes some practice and uh, uh, again on your first one, but rather than use your specimen piece of wood, I would uh, make yourself a couple of blocks, one of which you can use for practicing because you'll, you'll make some errors, you'll go a little bit too deep with the rasp and you'll get some flat spots. So it's like anything else, the technique that's learned with time and practice. Uh, but a rasp will get you a nice, smooth, rounded shape. Uh, once you complete that uh, process with the rasp, then it's time to sand it smooth and get it finally ready for finishing. Um, I use three grades of sandpaper. I'll start with either 60 or 80, whatever I've got, and then I'll go to either 120 or 150, whatever I've got, and then I'll finish with 220. And uh, once you get through 220, you've got a nice smooth finish and one that's perfect for going ahead and applying uh, the polyurethane finish to. All right, so that's the construction of the putter head. And we're going to pretend or assume that you've now gotten to that point. So now it's time to talk about finishing and how we can go ahead and put a nice, smooth, high gloss polyurethane finish on it. The first thing we'll do is talk about the secret sauce, which is not a secret. Uh, I happen to use this particular brand of polyurethane that's Minwex. It's uh, full gloss or clear gloss and it's fast drying. Uh, I prefer the fast drying just because I like to try to get two or three coats on in a day if I can. And you can't do that with the regular stuff. And I, I haven't seen any uh, less performance out of the fast drying than the regular stuff. Uh, I'm sure there are other brands that you can use out there that are just fine. I've, I've experimented with others and have not found a particular problem or advantage with any brand. I've just kind of settled in on this one. You can buy this at Dixie Line. You used to be able to buy it at Home Depot. They've discontinued it for some reason, but you can get it at Dixie Line. And uh, the other thing that I want to stress here, and this is one of those things you really want to write down and always keep first and foremost in your mind, and by the way, I'm going to share a lot of tips with you and a lot of you that have been uh, woodworking and finishing for a number of years are going to look back at this and say, you know, I'm not sure he really told me anything I didn't already know when it comes to finishing. And that's probably true. But the one thing I will tell you that I've learned is you not only need to know all of those steps, you got to do all of those steps. <laughs> And if, if you forget any, guess what? You're not gonna wind up with the result that you want. So uh, the first step is to start not only with a quality product like this, but also, and this is really important, is to make sure that it's fresh. Uh, going back many years, my standard on using finish would be to go into the paint cabinet and pull out whatever I got that's still sloshed when you move the can. And if it was still in liquid form, then that's what I used. Well, I've learned in spades that that's not the way to do it. And uh, what I do to make it easier to use this is I use little plastic squeeze bottles like this to put the finish in. And one of the things I noted, and one of the ways I noticed the importance of fresh product is that if you do this and you leave it sit uh, over time and use it over time, you'll see the color of this turn much darker. Uh, it goes from the, the, in this particular brand, looking like corn oil when it's fresh to more like dark maple syrup when it's not. And when you get it looking like maple syrup, its characteristics change. And even if you thin it out, it does not perform as well as when it's fresh. So 
my strongest advice to you, as hard as it may be for you to throw out a half a can of old varnish, is do just that and start with fresh product and you'll be ahead of the game right out of the gate. Um, to apply the finish, I literally use a one inch foam brush, which has the advantage of not only being inexpensive, but the real advantage of not having to clean it. And what I do is I just um, squirt some of this varnish into a small plastic cup like this. And in the initial two or three coats, I do it full strength, I don't thin it out. And give it a chance to uh, seal up the putter head and then the challenge is to um, just apply a coat to the putter head, uh, let it dry, sand it down, apply another coat, sand it down, apply another coat, let it dry, sand it down. Um, another important thing to remember, and it will tell you this on the directions, is to recoat in 24 hours. If you let this stuff fully cure the subsequent coats don't adhere as well. So if you get distracted or go out of town or, or whatever and wind up uh, letting it set up and really start to cure over 24, 48 or hours or longer, make sure you sand it down thoroughly with 220 and break that, that cure on top of it before you apply subsequent coats. All right, so now you've applied several coats of polish or excuse me, of, of polyurethane to the putter head. And you've noticed that you've still got some green showing. And obviously the reason for applying a number of coats is to fill that green, fill those small voids, and continue to sand down the mountaintops, if you will, and fill the valleys with more polyurethane until you get a totally smooth finish. Um, you will find that it will take an awful lot of coats to do that. And my average number of coats that I put on a putter head is between 10 and 12. But if you've got deep green and you don't do any filling, you'll wind up even having to do more than that if you want a, a, a totally smooth finish. One of the ways I get around that in dealing with uh, green, heavy green in a center stripe, for example, I'll occasionally use a wind gate in a, in a center stripe, but it's got really deep green, is I'll fill it. And occasionally I'll have small depressions in, in the green or next to a knot hole or something like that. And what I use to fill it is um, super glue. Uh, I just use uh, either medium or thick super glue. Uh, and I literally uh, squirt it onto the putter head after I've got the first few coats in. And the first few coats, by the way, will also highlight those depressions for you. So if you fill those uh, depressions with just a, a drop of super glue, and then I take a playing card and scrape it smooth so that it's nice and smooth. And then if you're in a hurry, like I always am, I put the, uh, uh, this activator. If you've not used activator with super glue, uh, you should treat yourself and buy yourself a can of this at Rockler. And uh, once you put that glue on the piece, you just spray it with this activator and it dries instantly. And what that does for you, of course, is you can immediately go ahead and sand it again and put another coat of varnish on and uh, keep the process moving along at a, at a good rate. Um, now, the other thing that you're going to run into, and Michael, if we can switch back to the uh, other camera. Is when you go to put uh, finish on the putter head, you're going to find that it's going to run. And particularly around the curves, uh, it's going to want to run off and, and drip on you and sag on you. And the way you get around that, I was lamenting my problem many years ago to a friend of mine, and he says, why don't you the same uh, solution that I use when I do uh, fishing rods? And he tied and would finish fishing rods. And the way he handled the wet finish was to simply use an old barbecue motor. All you have to do is literally tell your friend uh, in giving them your old, old cube motor that they're probably not using. Anyway, you may have one in the garage yourself. And all you have to do is mount it to a piece of plywood, put a little spigot on it like this, and you can mount the putter head in it. Let's see if I can arrange this so you can see it better. 
And then what you do is you create yourself some of these sticks, which is the old handle off of, of an old um, foam brush. You just mm -hmm. glue a hole in the end, cut the head off a drywall screw, epoxy it in, and then you just drill a hole into your putter head. You screw this in, and now you've got a nice handle for handling your uh, putter head during the entire finishing process. Uh, so the lunch, go ahead and, and apply finish with that foam brush. You simply uh, insert the end of that stick into your uh, rotisserie motor uh, and rest it on this thing here. Turn the motor on and it will keep it. Uh, a rotisserie motor turns about three or four RPMs and it's just the right speed for keeping that finish evenly spread across the face of the putter head until it has an opportunity to dry, which only takes 15 to 20 minutes in the normal conditions. This is a critical part of getting a nice smooth finish because you have, you know, obviously you can picture what's going to happen if you just try to leave it standing upright, you're going to have a sag or a drip somewhere. And this is a perfect solution to get a nice smooth finish on it. So with that, um, let me go ahead and I'll recap some of the important points in getting a nice smooth finish. Um, you'll want to uh, sand with 220 sandpaper between coats for the first several coats. Uh, as you get to the point where you've just about got the finish where you want, you might want to switch to using 320, even 400, or even 600. I have found that the smoother uh, you make the next to last, uh, the surface before the next to last coat or the last coat, uh, the better it looks. Um, you've filled your voids with super glue, and you've sanded and recoated and got to that point. Uh, now the big thing that you need to look out for is either nibs or bolts. And so let me give you a quick tip on both of those. Um, you've got to have just about a separate room to do the finishing. And if you try to do it in the room that you're generating sawdust, you're going to have some contamination. Con contamination. Uh, there's just no way around it. I'm fortunate enough to have a small greenhouse out behind my shop, and that's what I use for my finishing. But wherever you do it, uh, wipe it clean with paper towels and then wipe it down with a tack rag. And when the tack rag needs replacement, keep that one and use that as your first attempt. And then take a brand new fresh tack rag and wipe it once again to get every last speck of dust off before you go ahead and apply that last coat of finish. If you're applying the finish incorrectly, you'll get bubbles. And the way to avoid the bubbles is several things. First of all, Move your brush slowly. If you're getting bubbles, that's the first thing to check. You're probably in a hurry to get it on and you're smearing it on and, and you just can't do it quickly. You've got to move the brush painfully slowly and it will be hard to do, but that will alleviate a lot of your bubbling problem. The other thing to do is use a light touch. Uh, if you're still getting bubbles and you're moving slowly, it's because you're pressing down too hard. And then the third thing to do is, and this just comes with experience, and there's no way to do it other than to practice it and learn over time, is you've got to load the brush with the right amount of uh, polyurethane. If you get too little on there, you'll wind up with brush marks. If you get too much on there, you'll wind up with uh, runs and with drips. And so there's a happy medium in there, and it's just one of those things that you have to learn uh, over time with experience. So anyway, if you remember to do all of those things, uh, you're going to wind up eventually, if you stick with it through 10 to 12 coats, with a perfectly smooth and, and a nice full gloss finish. And uh, once you put that final coat on, you're there. You shouldn't have to add any polish or additional sanding or anything like that. It should look perfectly smooth and uh, perfectly glossy. So that in a nutshell, or as close as I could get to a nutshell and still get the information across is what I had to share with you today. Uh, so with that, let me go ahead and uh, stop there and uh, open it up to you for any questions that you might have. And I'm going to let Michael kind of orchestrate who's going to ask what and how we're going to handle the camera. So Gary, the question I have for you is how did you attach the uh, putter to the handle? That's a good question. Um, 
I've, you drill a hole in the putter head, and obviously one of the things you want to make sure is to not drill all the way through the putter head, by the way. And that, that can be done. It's not a happy moment because <laughs> you've already got a lot of work in that thing and you don't want a hole in the bottom. So uh, make sure when you use your drill press that, or the stop on, on the drill bit that you use and just pick out a drill bit that is just slightly smaller than the uh, drywall screw that you've got in the end of your handle. Uh, drill a pilot hole and then just take a pair of pliers, hold this and twist it into the, to the head until you get a nice firm uh, grip on that putter head. Other questions? <laughs> you know, I, not a great question. Going to be interesting. Questions. No, it was actually, it was very, it was very, very interesting. I had no idea how to do all that stuff. So thanks for the great presentation. Uh, just a small technical comment. When you got the rotisserie duda out and you were moving around, you moved away from your microphone some at that. Yeah, I'm going to have to deal with that microphone thing. Yeah, yeah. So Sound quality was good except for that one point. Yeah, except for the one point, it was fine. Um, personally, I thought the switching back and forth between the two platforms worked well between the two, you know, when we needed it to be you and when we needed it to be your stage. I thought that was really good. Um, when you held up the the polyurethane can, the fast dry stuff, it was almost just a shade too, it was right at the edge of where your camera could focus. Yeah, um, maybe I'll just ask you to go back to the other screen on that tomorrow. Okay, that's fine. I, I, you just The reason I didn't do it this time was because I was worried about that sound thing. And uh, then, of course, forgot it when I went to the other one. So. <laughs> Go figure. No, actually, I, I, to be honest, for the first time through, I thought it went very, very oh. well. I didn't realize you were so freaking talented. What an ear. Well, I, I'm, I picked up some tips. I've never heard of grain filling with uh, CA before. Well, it's, uh, I probably should talk a little bit more about that. I may try to do a demonstration on that. It's, it's very simple to do. You just literally dob it on and take a literally a piece of playing card and drag it over the depression. So you just kind of smooth it out and get rid of the excess CA. And you hit it with that accelerator, it dries it instantly, and you just immediately take 220 and sand it down and boom, you're done. That's it. That's a great tip. You know, that's that's better than grain filling because CA is clear when it's after it's been uh, sanded and leveled out. Exactly. And if you're trying to grain fill with burl or something, you're trying to use filler, you color. Or you're oh, yeah. It yeah, looks. I use epoxy for it, but I, I got to wait for it. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. Just as a, uh, a suggestion, maybe you should have a, a finished one that you could, you know, hey, this is what it looks like when you're done. I, I should, Mike, and I... I knew that, but I forgot it, and I realized that I I felt naked because I didn't have one to reach for at the end. So yes. Yeah, I mean, all of, all of the intermediate steps were great. I thought that was really cool. I thought, oh, well, where where are we going to be here when we're done? Yep, exactly. I'll have I've never one. heard of the rotisserie idea before. I like that too for small items. It's a wonderful because ironically, it just happens that it it turns at exactly the right speed, and I'll bet I have burned out six or eight rotisserie motors over the years, but uh, boy, it's, it's sure the way to finish yeah, well, I'll tell you, I've got out of this what I was hoping for when, when we first talked about it. I, when I first saw your putters, I just sat and looked at it for a long time trying to figure out